And greetings, everybody, and welcome to Comorbidities 3 in NS5344. I'm not even going to try to tell you. I, we're in Unit 2. At the end of Unit 2, that, that's all I got for you. So we've discussed a move away mouse. We've kind of we've looked over some of the comorbidities. We have discussed wounds particularly. And so how I think the a viable question is so how does this impact day-to-day -day practice? What does this look like in in a practice setting? And this is actually one of the things I love most about gerontology. There, there's quite a few things I enjoy about the the subject. But one of the things I really enjoy is how complex it is. This is these are multi-factor cases. This is this is complex hard medicine here, if you will. So I'm going to walk you through some of my thought processes, how I go about discussing a patient and helping them, and uh, what it was like for me at the beginning. Because if this is brand new to you, uh, it can feel kind of overwhelming. There's a lot going on, and I, I totally get it. So story time and everything in this one. And you can tell you, we're, it's casual today. We're going casual. Put up your feet. Get yourself a beverage. We're going to do a little, just a little bit of reflection on this. And here's Gertie. Gertie's going to be with us today. She's a um, composite of all of the different patients I have worked with. She's presenting today with a stage 3 pressure ulcer, uh, stage 3 chronic kidney disease, a BMI of 17.5, type 2 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and she's also a heavy alcohol and tobacco user. So, we talked earlier about comorbidities and what the number of comorbidities in the United States looks like. Um, I'm going to kind of go up from, it was percentages, I'm going to kind of go from a different angle just to show you what we're talking about here. In America, there are 70 million people that have, 70 peoples? No, 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 people, that have one, at least one chronic condition. And there are 11 million that have more than five. Now, if you remember early on, uh, that the elderly population is about 15%, a little more than 15% of the total population of the U.S. But they consume over a third of the health care in the U.S. Given that, I would be comfortable extrapolating that quite a few of this 11 million number here is uh, represents the elderly. I couldn't get data on that. It does re uh, reflect my own personal experience, but again, I don't have hard numbers for you. This is just kind of a, a guess. But remember, at least 11 million people do have five or more. So what does that look like? What are the numbers here? Um, if you take out arthritis, which I did in this case, because honestly, in a gerontology setting, just about everybody's got arthritis. So you break it down from there, 40% of the population presents with hypertension, 20% presents with mental illness, 15% with diabetes, and the most common cause of death in elderly patients are uh, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And honestly, that reflects the general population as well, except for young men, and accidents is, are accidents are the most common uh, cause of death up until like early to mid-20s. But for everybody else, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. So... How do you parse all that information you have on a person? How do you sift through everything and make sense of what's going on? Um, this is something I worked with a lot when I was a dietary manager and then when I became an intern and worked you know, specifically going back into gerontology. I wanted to do that, but there's a lot going on. So I found some dictums that helped me think through it. And I said, coming up, important story about a preceptor. Uh, the first one I found is Woodward's dictum. And if you know any of these, you know, you know Woodward's. Woodward's says, if you hear hoof beats, don't look for zebras. And that means that the most common cause of a symptom or sign is the most common cause for a reason. It's boring, it's generic, but it's the most common cause for a reason. So if you don't have a logical reason or some information, evidence that presents counter to that narrative, assume the most common cause as default. And what does that look like? So we'll go through a couple of these here. If you have a patient with swollen, bleeding gums, tooth pain, and tooth loss, 
what would be the first thing you would think of? Or what would, may not be the first thing you think of, but what would be your first assumption of what was going on? Would you anticipate this was a case of vitamin C deficiency or poor dental hygiene? Obviously, the first best case or best guess is poor dental hygiene. Run with that until you have some reason to assume otherwise. And obviously, follow up on the other ones too, but begin at the outset by assuming poor dental hygiene. Okay, let's do another one here. Um, a patient that complains of acidic stomach, nausea, and burps, would you expect acid reflux or would you assume Zollinger-Ellison syndrome? You, your initial guess or assu assumption, suspicion, should be acid reflux. Could be Zollinger-Ellison, but there are other issues with that than just those. So they're, the most common assumption, or the, the first suspicion should be acid reflux. The second one, and this is big in gerontology, is Hickam's dictum, which is that the patient can have as many conditions as they damn well please. So Hickam's is saying, don't be intimidated by a large list of conditions or uh, diagnoses. And we're obviously doing nutrition diagnoses, not medical diagnoses. But don't be intimidated by a large wall of diagnoses, uh, medical diagnoses. Don't assume you're wrong because you're coming up with four or five issues that you're seeing nutritionally. It's completely possibly correct. They can have as many conditions as they want. Maybe they, well, want might be a bit of a wrong word, but maybe they are, they are protein depleted and have diabetes and have incorrect health beliefs and have a knowledge deficit. All of those are totally possible to be writing together. Now, what's the, what, what do we do about that with all of those, um, <laughs> all, all of Hickam's dictums or all, all of the conditions involved there? Okay, story time. When I was an intern, I was working, at, or I was rounding at the VA and I had a patient that had very, very serious wounds. And they were also just on the edge of going into kidney failure. They were borderline. And I was just tossing this in my head over and over. And I, what do I do? I Obviously, the, the correct intervention for wounds is increased protein and calories. But kidney failure, what do I do? And I finally gave up and I went to the preceptor and I was like, I, I don't know what to do here. And she asked me, what do you think is going to kill him first? I said, well, the wounds are going to kill him first. And she said, right, the wounds are the problem, the, the biggest problem. So we're going to address the wounds. Once that's resolved, we will move on to kidney function. If the kidneys fail while we're being treated, he's being treated for the wound, that doesn't make the wound problem go away. We'll just have to address and control as best we can for kidneys if that occurs. So Owen's triage dictum um, is it's named after her. This is my own creation, so don't, don't go looking for this anywhere. If you're presented with multiple conditions, identify the patient's most pressing issue and identify that first. Target what you think is the most serious thing. Address the most serious thing. Address any issues that come up from that. But remember that your primary focus is still the most important issue. Right? Or your primary focus should be the most important pressing issue for the patient. Okay? So, let's go back to Gertie. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's her graphic for you. I, man, I can never... There, that way. It's over there. Um... So I break it down, and this is what I'm going to do with, with Gertie here in a second. I break this down into three categories personally. Uh, I categorize them as deadly, critical, and chronic. So an example of deadly would be wounds, or refeeding syndrome. These are things that are actually going to impact health immediately and could potentially be life-threatening if they don't get support. Now, we're nutrition. Nothing moves fast here. So... It is not as though, well, refeeding can, I guess. It's not as though we're going to come dashing into the ER and, and save this person with a you know, stat parental feeding. 
but this is very, you know, wounds and refeeding, very pressing. Uh, critical is something that definitely could become dangerous or deadly later, but at the moment it's stable but a concern. So, um, and this can, in this example, underweight, kidney disease are ones that I would consider to be critical. Uh, chronic are things that are stable but nutritionally relevant. So, in this example, di uh, diabetes and obesity. Okay. Now we're going to Gertie. So, looking at Gertie, considering what's going on, here's here's her list of conditions again. What what would be, what would I categorize as, as deadly? I would categorize her pressure injury, and her her blah, excuse me, uh, underweight weight status as deadly. I would consider her kidney disease to be critical. And I would consider her diabetes and her rheumatoid arthritis to be chronic. Now, I can definitely see, remember, this is just my own system. There's no validation for this whatsoever. So don't, don't be citing this or anything. I can definitely see how you could make a really legitimate argument for the BMI is critical and maybe the kidney disease is chronic. I, this is a spectrum. This is, again, just a thought exercise for how to organize a large number of comorbidities. Now, it's also worth mentioning that Gertie still has tobacco use and alcohol use, and that is an issue for for her. Bad Gertie. But I would actually put that, at most, I would put that under uh, chronic. You know, I'm going to address the diabetes first, then we'll come back to uh maybe helping do some counseling to see if we can help her with her alcohol and tobacco issues. All right, so what, what, do, we, what do we take from this? Comorbidities and chronic disease are a fact of life in gerontology. If you're working with an elderly population, you're going to see these. It's just going to happen. Remember that Woodward says, assume the most common cause unless you have contradictory evidence. Hickam says, don't be intimidated by large numbers of comorbidities. And Owen says that when you're prevented, prevented, presented with multiple comorbidities, address the most critical issue first, and what can you do about that most critical issue? All right. If you have any questions, as always, please let me know. I'll catch you guys next time for the beginning of Unit 3. Have a good one. I'll see you later. Bye.